Welcome to Longevity by Design, a podcast designed to give individuals access to the leading scientific information in the field of longevity. The ability to add years to your life and life to your years needs no opinion. Join us as we ask science to take the wheel. In each episode, Dr. Gil Blander joins a co-host and an industry expert in the field of longevity, shining a light and getting the answers to the key question, how can we live a longer, healthier life? Hello, I'm Ashley Reaver, and I'm joined by Dr. Gil Blander. Welcome to Longevity by Design, How to Live a Longer, Healthier Life. We're produced by Inside Tracker, your science-based guide to optimizing your body from the inside out. Our guest today is Dr. Mitch Roslin. Dr. Roslin is the Chief of Bariatric Surgery at Lenox Hospital in New York City and has dedicated his professional career to the treatment of obesity. Dr. Roslin is the editor of the video textbook of bariatric surgery, serves as the major teaching proctor for sleeve gastrectomy and duodenal switch, and is the course director for symposiums on revisional bariatric surgery. Dr. Roslin is an innovator in the search for better treatments and holds several patents in the emerging field of pacing technology for the treatment of obesity. Dr. Roslin recently has been selected as one of the best minimally invasive surgeons in New York. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Thank you for having me. It's really great, um, and I love the stuff that you guys are doing. So, Mitch, uh, uh, we are very excited to have you, and actually you are, uh, if my, my memory is not uh, wrong, you are the first uh, a practicing physician but also doing research that... Uh, uh, joining us for this podcast, and uh, it's really exciting to see also uh, what happening in the operation room and what uh, happening in the real life, and not only scientists like me that only uh, deal with mice and uh, worms and his. So it's uh, uh, really exciting to have you with us. We also spent uh, a few hours yesterday together, so uh, I have some a head start start on Ashley uh, with uh, some questions. So. Sorry, Ashley, I, will, I might ask a lot of questions based on uh, our informal, informal uh, discussion yesterday. But uh, Mitch, maybe we'll start from the beginning. So we usually ask questions about your background and why have you decided in your case to, have, uh, to become a physician and a surgeon and uh, what attracts you to uh, be also a scientist and do experiment and uh, uh, try to be in the bleeding edge of uh, science. So great question. I mean, I think I grew up in Brooklyn, New York, um, like a lot of uh, children of Jewish immigrant uh, parents. I think we w realized we weren't going to be tall enough to play for the Knicks, talented enough to play for the Mets or the Yankees. <laughs> so we better do well in school. And uh, they sent us to, I went to Stuyvesant High School and then to the University of Pennsylvania and then to medical school. Um, a, while in medical school, you know, th what to do, I think role models become really, really, really important. Uh, and it's interesting that my role model in medical school was somebody by the name of Gene Copper. And today he's still the, the chief of surgery where I'm practicing in Northwell. Um, and, you know, surgery was, you know, to, in, in my mind, we were actually doing things as opposed to just thinking about things. And I've kind of gone probably the opposite direction of everybody that you had, where we kind of started with what we were able to do and seeing the results and then became very fascinated, especially when people in my office where my dietitians were asking me questions, for example, is why do patients need an operation to, to work? Why can't it just be, you know, diet and exercise? Why can't these things work? And kind of how to put these things together is what interested me and actually started our relationship because I think the stuff that you guys are doing is great and yet we bring the real life experience to it. We actually can show in a short period what the impact of, of weight loss or eating differently and a more active lifestyle, what the pros, what cons, what systems are activated. And I think it leads to a, a fantastic discussion and really brings, you know, is the clinic, the best clinical model we have for all of the things that you guys are talking about academically. 
absolutely. I think that's a, a, also a good segue to back up and talk about some big definitions. So, you know, what is obesity and, and how common is it in the United States as something that, you know, can lead to uh, many types of conditions that have an impact on health span in addition to lifespan? Um, and are we seeing any specific trends in the incidence of diabetes over the years or especially now? Well, you know, great question. So the true definition of obesity is excess adiposity, but, you know, we don't like to measure that by using too much body composition stuff. So we tend to use a proxy, a number that puts height and weight together called body mass index has a lot of inaccuracies, but as you move to the higher numbers, you probably, there aren't going to be too many LeBron Jameses, in other words, that get the high body mass because they have a lot of muscle mass. So um, a body mass index of 25 is considered normal height and weight. Body mass index of 30 is considered obese. Morbidly obese or class three obesity, which is where surgery really started, but it's actually come down as, you know, the impact and safety have grown, starts at a BMI of 40. To put that into perspective to an American audience, that's about a person who's five foot four and weighs about 230 pounds or, you know, five foot three, 220 pounds roughly would be in the body mass index of, of 40 variety. When you ask about the penetration of obesity, well, really, really kind of interesting. Um, obesity and overweight is up to about 60% American adults. When you look at obesity alone, females, you see numbers up at about 40%, a little bit lower with males. And the pertinence to that in a, in a longevity conversation, as we all know from your other guests, that females on average live longer than males. So obesity is an important marker but it's not the only marker out there. Um, and, you know, again, epidemic of chronic diseases that are related to insulin resistance, probably related to processed food. So we're seeing an epidemic of type two diabetes, but probably about 80% of the people that we see with obesity are also insulin resistant. Um, so really complex problem. And one of the things as you point to is concept of, you know, I'm the healthiest heavy person you're ever going to meet. Well, the problem with that is how do we measure healthy? And I mean, I guess that's some of the stuff that we've discussed offline. Yeah. That's a uh, astonishing that 40% of the population are obese. That's a, uh, that's a, not a small issue. It's a very big issue, let's say. And, uh, well, what's fascinating. I like to talk about the ironies that we see in obesity. So, and, and it seems one of the great things is, and this is such a great conversation to talk about because everybody has an opinion, but it really is the more, you know, the kind of strange things that come into play. So the original people that were involved in obesity research in the United States tended to be psychologists looking for that obese personality, like Mickey Skunkard from university of Pennsylvania, one of the greatest you know, researchers of, of all time was a psychologist and he was looking for an obese personality. And then he ran around the world and he found all of the twins that were separated at birth and raised in different environments. And he found that their concordance in body mass index was over 90%. You virtually never see anything with a 90% concordance. So that tells you strong genetic predisposition. On the other hand, when Everett Koop, who was the Surgeon General under Ronald Reagan, started talking and saying, it's not AIDS, it's not anything else. Obesity and a sedentary lifestyle are the biggest problems facing the United States. That's back in the Reagan era. The total amount of people who were obese in the United States was between 10 and 15%. So nothing that's purely genetic can increase that rapidly. So we know that it's both epigenetic and genetic. Yeah, mixture of nature and nurture. What has changed so much in our environment? Do you feel like over those, you know, that last time period, that's really activated I, I think a, so much of the genetics? I, you know, I think the availability of processed food, packaged food, the re-engineering of food. I mean, I think that people like Robert Lustig have done a great job of highlighting that. I think the best studied is probably fructose 
you know, that's been fructose free corn syrup. And it's important to know that, you know, on one hand, and this goes to show, and one of the things that Gil and I talked about continuous glucose monitoring, fructose and sucrose uh, and glucose come together to form sucrose and table sugar. Um, but where fructose exists in the environment is always combined with fiber. But when you have fructose corn syrup, there is not any fiber in there. And it's interesting, fructose was something that we sensed at the end of the harvest to kind of give us a signal to store fat rather than break down fat. And where fructose is really interesting and, and tells people to take a step back to everything that they read, you know, every, the people who, you know, who are listening to this are probably overall healthy people. What are the, what they think and what they can learn from a bariatric surgeon? Well, one, we give you an example of how some of these things work, but you know, the idea that a lower sugar is always better because fructose will not raise your glucose. And people actually looked at it for diabetes yet. It probably is one of the most detrimental things in the diet when it's taken without fiber. So when you eat fruit, God has given you the antidote. Fiber's right there. Yeah. When you eat it individually, what fructose can be at high supply is rather than cause chemical energy to be formed, such as ATP in the liver, it actually acts as an energy sump. And it actually causes the breakdown of ATP to AMP, forming uric acid and citrate, which I'm sure the other people on your podcast have talked about, which seems to be the start of really severe metabolic syndrome. So I will tell you that what I've learned is, is that obesity is a progressive accelerating disease. People always say, well, is it calories in, calories out? Well, it always is, but the way you process calories changes. So when people, you know, think about, you know, listening to the podcast, they say, well, I used to be able to eat everything. Now I can't, you know, my practice mm -hmm. has a lot of menopausal women who said, you know, I could have lost a few pounds. Now I've gone through menopause. It's all here and I've gained weight and I can't lose any weight. And, you know, so the way they're processing fuel is different and the way their mitochondria handles the different fuels, whether it's glycogen or fat. Um, is very, very different as you expand. And as you get older, you lose mitochondria, which oxidize fat. And that process is really accelerated by obesity. So kind of way I look at obesity, especially after the research we did at COVID, is that it accelerates your aging. So people who are obese are basically using more miles on the car on a yearly basis. So, so that's a great uh, uh, background of uh, obesity, Mitchell. Uh, we we now see how bad is it and uh, what uh, how dangerous it is. So, what is the most uh, uh, effective way to prevent uh, obesity? So, avoidance of processed food. The healthiest diet has a protein source and two thirds of a source that has a lot of fiber in it. And, you know, again, it really, really, you have Ashley on the podcast, you can talk about this. It starts when kids are young. It probably starts in utero because we now know the impact of women that have very high insulin levels during their pregnancy that's passed along to the baby. Additionally, the amount of processed food and sugar that you receive in your Infancy, childhood actually up regulates the receptors that help you absorb sugar. There also is what people don't realize, it's really fascinating. You know, there are very athletic type one diabetics that require very few units of insulin. So being active is so important. You know, and one of the things that is really kind of one of the paradoxes, like obesity is full of paradoxes, like fat doesn't cause a fatty liver, okay? Um, actually, fructose and alcohol cause a, a, a fatty liver. But one of the great paradoxes that's very difficult to explain to people is exercise itself has never been shown to be a great weight loss thing in people who are obese. 
but exercise is the only way to prevent weight regain once you lose weight. Mm -hmm. So it just goes to show how difficult, you know, there's two challenges in my line of work. The first is getting people to lose weight by eating. And, and, and the second, which is even harder, even following surgery, is getting them to maintain weight loss. Yeah, I remember learning in school something, you know, over the five years following weight loss surgery, the percentage of individuals that regain weight is pretty significant. Um, do, you have, do you remember that off the top of your head? That was a few years ago for me. <laughs> well, so again, really important, and this is, this is why, you know, teaming up and do, looking at research with, with Inside Tracker is so exciting to me. Because on one hand, we can show the real short-term benefits, in other words, in a magnified way of eating differently and, and, and showing biomarkers truly improving and show that what we eat and what we put into it can really change our biomarkers. On the other hand, we can additionally try to prevent kind of some of the negative things. So what I will tell you, Ashley, is the simplest operations when they only manipulate the stomach will have less weight loss and more recidivism. When I go in and I manipulate, mm -hmm. and as I showed Gil yesterday, the stomach and the intestine in an operation I helped develop called SADIA, the single anastomosis DS, will get 40% body weight loss and a very small to much lower tail of recidivism. I mean, just like, you know, a real estate market, once it reaches the NADA, it, it, it can only go up. So what I will tell you is that the stomach will get weight off. When we bypass the intestine, we probably change some degrees of metabolism. We pass certain receptors. We're stimulating many of the drugs that are coming to market for medical obesity. But the consequence of doing that is that we're creating potential micronutrient deficiencies, things like vitamin D. So supplements become more important. Um, again, if you're not eating enough protein or doing some resistance training, you know, the bugaboo about weight loss is that there's no way to lose weight without losing lean muscle mass at the same time. Yet nobody mm -hmm. in the weight loss industry has kind of put those things on a continuum. And that's kind of where I'm hoping to bring this field in the future. Because long term, you know, what I can tell you with our patients, we're truly decreasing the risk of dying from cancer truly decreasing the risk of dying of heart disease, truly reduce, reducing the risk of stroke, basically, as you talk about, increasing the health span. But on the back side of that, we're going to have to deal with the fact that as we age, we all lose muscle mass, we all lose bone mass, and we could be accelerating that. And that's why I think we can do better with real accurate trackers of biomarkers. Very, uh, very interesting, Rich. And uh, maybe we'll go uh, back to the basic and basically what are the criteria for a person to become a, a subject for bariatric surgery? Do you need to be at a certain age, certain BMI, certain? So it is changing rapidly and it just goes to show, you know, you, you ask how you get into the, this field and, and, and stuff like that. There's been so much bias and, and things like that. So the classic answer would be class three obesity, BMI of 40, or class two obesity with a life-threatening condition like diabetes secondary to it. But now what we realize, and, and again, you wouldn't need to have this podcast. We wouldn't need inside tracker. We would not be searching for biomarkers if... BMI would correlate with that. We would just need to weigh you and measure you, and we'd have everything that we need to know. And, you know, that's not terrible. That's where the Metropolitan Life Chart started. So it gives you some in information. You know, basically, these charts were just established by insurance companies and saw that. But we really know there's so much individual difference. So now, more than ever, the criteria for surgery seems to be going down, but also what's exciting is the toolbox for those patients. For example, medications, potentially endoscopic procedures, 
attitudes of doctors where people are beginning to realize more so, yeah, we're not exactly sure what turns on the problem with obesity. What's the problem, the underlying problem? People with obesity are more likely to, to form fat tissue than oxidize and break down fat tissue where that happens. And then it becomes really hard to lose weight. All these things need to be figured out, but there's becoming much more of an understanding that we have to treat this along with prevention. And we're finally waking up to the fact that treatment and prevention don't mean the same thing. Okay. And yet in obesity, it's been kind of ironic and almost stupid that people want to treat obesity the same way they want to prevent it. Well, it hasn't worked that well for prevention, which was Ashley's first question. But could you imagine telling somebody that has lung cancer that you want them to stop smoking? They would tell you that the horse already left the barn door. So we <laughs> kind of have to begin to wake up and treat these things because if not, we're seeing an epidemic of the chronic diseases. And what we really see in obesity is those chronic diseases come earlier in life. And economically, if we have any legislators looking at that, we are now seeing a group of kids that come into maturity already on type 2 diabetes medications. So our whole healthcare system is based on people who are young, working and contributing. But if we have people disabled by metabolic disease at 22, that's a terrible equation. And it's going to come into the armed forces. It's going to come into every aspect of our lives. And what we're seeing is a real bipolar distribution where obviously you wouldn't have a business. There wouldn't be people listening to this podcast who weren't involved in every single thing, whether it's a continuous glucose monitor, or whether it's inside track, or whether it's liquid biomarkers. And then on the other hand, a whole population that's getting less and less healthy by the day, exacerbated by COVID, exacerbated by inflation. Because if we go out to eat a salad, you know, with a protein sauce, it, we're probably talking for the three of us to eat between 60 and $80. Interesting. Very interesting and uh, uh, very sad uh, uh, reality. So Mitch, uh, uh, for our audience, I think that it will be interesting for them to understand the, the basic of uh, what is a bariatric surgery. You, you touch it a uh, very high level, but... Uh, you showed me yesterday a movie of 20 minutes that show exactly what's happening there. So if you can summarize it in one minute, what what what's happening in bariatric surgery, how long it's taking and so on. So that, that's that's great. So one of the great things in my life is, is that bariatric surgery started with you're going to do what to whom to now being a serious academic part, uh, department in every leading hospital in the country with very good safety, not perfect, but very good safety results, bringing the surgery equivalent to the morbidity and the complication rate equivalent to joint replacement surgery. So essentially what we do in bariatric surgery is we can manipulate the stomach, which is really, really important as a reservoir for food and also determining how hungry we are or the intestine, which is where food's absorbed very, very important for determining metabolism and probably more important to determining fullness. And when you first hear about bariatric surgery, you kind of think of it as we're just creating a mechanical barrier. We, you, you know, hate to say it, but clipping a bird's wings would be equivalent. But it, what's really fascinating is that when we change the GI tract, we're changing the gut-brain interaction. So when we make the stomach small, yes, a small amount of food, when we make the stomach a tube in a sleeve gastrectomy, and essentially when we do a sleeve gastrectomy, which has become the most popular international operation, we reduce the size of the stomach by 80 to 90%, and we make the stomach look from a kind of kidney-shaped bean to look like a banana or a tube. Well, when you have a narrow radius, a small amount will create a higher pressure eliciting the mechanical receptors. In addition, though, when we remove the stomach, several other things happen. You hear your stomach growling when you're hungry. That's actually uh, hormones producing motility, such as ghrelin. So when we remove the stomach, we remove some of the hunger hormones that communicate with the brain. Additionally, 
part of the stomach actually creates a chyme and that chyme helps break down certain food. It also adds sodium. And you know that most sugar absorption requires sodium, it's an active transport process in the small bowel. So we're changing that. When you make something narrow, the emptying speeds up and then we stimulate the intestine. When we stimulate the intestine, we're trying to tell the body that it's received enough food. And actually the drugs that we're seeing now in medical obesity actually are produced in the intestinal cells. They're so-called incretins and they're secreted when food is, is released to the intestine. And that incretin level increases markedly following bariatric surgery. So when we do the operations to kind of change the stomach alone, like sleeve in, you know, many, 10 years ago, there was a phase of doing lap bands and kind of that's cooled off as people have realized that having foreign bodies is not the greatest thing in young people. The patients will lose about 30% of their body weight. And on average, over five years, they'll gain about 30% of that back. Then when we go ahead and we add an intestinal operation, Classically, that's been done with the gastric bypass, but that's actually been part of my research to look at new ways of doing that. Um, and we kind of detour the food. So now instead of using um, eight meters or 22 to 24 meter, feet of intestine, we're only using say 10 to 12 feet of intestine or three meters of food. What happens when you're now bypassing a lot of places where food is absorbed favorably, and really stimulating the distal gut. And when we do that, we have less of what's called adaptive thermogenesis. So when you only deal with the stomach, what happens, people lose weight, but their metabolism goes markedly down. They, they, you know, we see that in any way. So if I take a person who's lost a lot of weight, say gone from 250 to 200, and I find another person, same height, same sex, same age, 200 pounds, and likelihood, the person who's lost weight metabolic rate is going to be 15 to 20% lower. And that's why it's so hard. So if you only manipulate the stomach, your metabolism goes down and the amount that you're eating kind of increases over time, which is why avoiding junk foods is so important and why exercise is so essential. When you add the intestine, it has like a real kind of metabolic factor that, that kind of, you know, kind of blunts that type of reaction. So the classic stomach and intestinal operation has been the gastric bypass, still a very popular operation, still a very effective operation. I don't love it. I look at the gastric bypass as kind of something that we inherited because it causes a lot of up and downs in sugar. And when we actually look at the culprits for obesity, I think we wanna to try to avoid that crescendo, decrescendo in glucose and insulin bypass kind of encourages is that, which is why I was so instrumental in creating a post-pyloric operation called Sadie SIPS or single anastomosis DS for people who need more weight loss than say a sleeve. And are these all minimally invasive surgeries and, now or are some much more intense? Virtually everything is done, whether through a laparoscope or robotically now, depending on you know, surgeon's age, preference, et cetera. Uh, uh, you know, the robot is great technology, but basically virtually 100% of these cases are done you know, morbidly, minimally invasively. Significant places around the country, some of them are being sent home the same day. Our average length wow. of stay, you know, is usually about one day. And, you know, but unfortunately, again, surgery is not a cure for obesity, okay? Surgery is not a cure for obesity, and it, 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 it's a great tool to take people and promote all of the things that you guys are talking about from longevity. But what, what I basically explain to people is I don't do weight loss surgery. I do eat differently and eat less surgery, and hopefully weight loss and longevity are the, the beneficial effects of that. So. It's really, really important to note that I'm not operating in this, this real kind of gap. I'm not making the pretzel healthier in the operating. <laughs> I'm making it so you get full faster, 
you're less hungry, you're less driven by your impulses, so you can hopefully listen, you know, be guided by solid nutritional advice to a better method. And again, misnomer, irony, overweight people are not overnourished, you know, they're overfed. They don't have higher lean muscle mass. They're not doing more squats. They're not going to have more powerful grip strength. And it's really, really important to get that message across, which is, again, such value that I see in collaborating with, with what you're doing. And how would you quantify so, so, we, success? Oh, so. Oops, sorry, Gil. I would just say, you know, what would no, no, success go, go, go. look like post-bariatric surgery? Is it a percentage of weight loss? Is it maintenance of weight loss? Is it improvement so the, of those markers? What does that look like? Well, so classically, what we've looked at and done a really good job is with different operations saying 50% of excess weight loss is defined as weight loss success, resolution of diabetes, improvement of cholesterol, elimination of meds, and again, really, really important. We are one of the few medical therapies that has shown a survival advantage. So if you look at the sweetest obese subjects, when you took people, okay, this is so important to the longevity space because reaching across and trying to take all of the great research and collaborate it to what we're doing because we are really the human model that has a survival advantage. So if you take the Swedish obese subject data, which was done in operations that I would say are not as efficacious as what we are doing today, and you look at the registry of people who had surgery and they've matched it across the board, strong survival improvement to the patients who've had surgery. My friend Ali Alamin at Cleveland Clinic just published a fantastic paper along with Steve Nissen and the people of Cleveland Clinic showing a stock reduction in cancer deaths following bariatric surgery. And that's really where the people who are following you see the correlation, whereas many of the people outside, they think about obesity and heart disease. They think about obesity and diabetes. They think about obesity and stroke. They don't think about obesity and cancer, but you know, all of the things that you guys have talked about, talk about insulin growth factor and how that stimulates cells. I know you had a longevity design uh, podcast with a cancer researcher, and he was talking about one of the sirtuins, sirtuin 6. All of it is about, you know, an obese over environment encourages malignant growth. And actually cancer cells have what's called a Warburg effect, just similar to obese people. And they only oxidize carbohydrate or glycogen or glucose rather than oxidize fat. So the impact of surgery, changing your eating behavior, leading to a survival advantage, even in cancer, is really, really, really profound. And I think it, it gives a great amount of encouragement for people who don't require bariatric surgery and also demonstrates how important it is to potentially more aggressively treat people who are afflicted by obesity. And what we're going to find is that cancer and dementia are probably more metabolic disease than genetic diseases per se. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's, uh, that's really fascinating. And Mitch, I would like to go a bit back to uh, the point that you said about a uh, bariatric surgery, the surgery versus the change of lifestyle. So can you try to quantify it and say, let's assume that you have a patient that done the bariatric surgery and went back to McDonald's and eat a, a, a whatever, the hamburger there every day versus someone that changed completely his diet. What are the changes in the effect on the weight and survival and the longevity? So again, you're never going to out operate an unhealthy diet. My guess is that if we were really aggressive with the operation and they go back to McDonald's and stuff like that is they would probably lose weight, but it all, a lot of it wouldn't be good weight loss. And then they'd have a much higher chance of having frequent bowel movements, nutritional deficiencies, 
and then they'd show up in your office three years later and you know the first year or two their reserve would be fine especially if they're young and then three years later they're weak they don't have strength to do things and things like that with the sleeve gastrectomies my guess is that they would do fine for the first year because we give them such quantity control additionally the compliance is usually very good at the first and then gradually gain weight over the next few years um but you are never going you know we get into this whole thing that being skinny is not synonymous with being healthy and one of the things that we haven't really done and i can throw the question back to you and ashley is how do you define health i mean in essence that's what inside tracker is looking inside so that we're not judging a book by its cover. I mean, yeah. Gil, both you and I have had Jewish have Jewish mothers, right? I you can't tell me you've never gotten a call. Let me tell you about so and so. He was perfectly <laughs> healthy and now he just had a big heart attack and you know he's in the yes. ICU. No, he wasn't perfectly healthy. You probably just didn't know of the severity of his atherosclerosis. Yeah. It just yeah. didn't happen like this. It's not like, you know, lightning just hit him in the parking lot. You know? Yeah, yeah, that, that, that's exactly the explanation of the naysayer. I remember that I once uh, hop on the plane to San Francisco and I sat ne a, a, a next to a person and he, and he opened his uh, a bag and uh, uh, put on the tray like his diet and uh, he started eating and we started to talk with him and I asked him, how do you know that it's good for you? He said, what are you talking about? I know everything. I know what is good for you. And that's the people that actually know what is good for them, know that they are doing whatever they, uh, is good for them. And you cannot, that's a, a subpopulation that you cannot do anything about that. And they will find the example of uh, the marathon runner that died from heart attack. And they, they say, hey, marathon is bad. Well, um, so. <laughs> absolutely. You know, again, you can only play the deck of cards and probability that you, you, you've been dealt. I mean, yeah. you know, again, we know that there are lung, you know, cancer survivors, you know, not, not lung cancer. There are people that have smoked into their nineties and are perfectly yeah. healthy. Obviously they're more resistant, you know, all, you can't listen to an aging podcast where people don't say, well, the biggest risk factor of cancer is not cigarette smoking or uh, obesity. It's age. Well, that's obviously, absolutely, you know, absolutely 100 percent true but what is also a hundred percent true is that when you smoke and you eat poorly you're creating a phase change so what you would call your inner age and i would call your physiologic age is much older than your chronologic age and how we can bring that out and show both the improvement and the detriment i think is really quite interesting for the future yeah, uh, absolutely. And uh, Mitch, you, you discuss a bit the benefit of uh, uh, bariatric surgery. So you discuss uh, uh, less cancer and uh, less dementia and so on. Uh, I would love uh, for you to elaborate a bit about that and uh, talking about other benefits. And also yesterday we discussed a bit about the negative effect of bariatric surgery, obviously a bit later, but if you can discuss both the uh, positive effect and the negative effect, that would be great. So again, the immediate benefit, uh, uh, beneficial effects is, you know, most of our patients are insulin resistant. A good 30% have type two diabetes. We all know the impact of every organ in the body from the brain to dementia, uh, to the eyes, you know, with retinopathy, wet and dry retinopathy, um, glaucoma, kidneys, re renal failure, fatty liver epidemic. And especially when you go into the low BMIs, Ashley, seeing tons and tons of national BMI, really, especially in Asian people, fatty liver, infertility, the biggest source of infertility right now is PCOS, uh, dealing with it. So when I think about obesity and I evaluate patients, I, I think about the M's. So the mechanical consequences, which I would cause the issue on your joints, both direct because they're, you know, if you put more force on something, going to break down earlier. But again, obesity, because of the reasons we discussed, inflammatory disease. So when you look at your markers, 
obese people are going to have higher SED rates, higher CRPs. That is going to lead to accelerated breakdown of their cartilage and, you know, even conditions called, you know, nonspecific arthritis you know, or, you know, connective tissues or autoimmune diseases caused by obesity. So mechanical is even metabolic in a strange way. Another me mechanical consequence, obese people have sleep apnea. Can't be understated. Okay. If somebody, if you look at, again, probability, we think of accidents can happen to everybody. Anybody who's surgically trained like me realizes the influence of drug and alcohol. And then the cause right underneath that is falling asleep secondary to sleep apnea. Okay. Real, real seriousness. What that really does is it gives you, in the long run, pulmonary hypertension, change in the geometry of your heart. It also has huge cognitive issues because if you don't sleep well, you can't pay attention. Um, and one of the major things that we've seen in our pediatric population is how much they improve in school. And that improvement in concentration may be related to, to, to sleep. Metabolic, again, don't just look at hemoglobin A1C. Because when you look underneath that, you have high insulin levels. And what I will tell you is the high insulin level and the high triglyceride levels are going to correlate more with fat infiltration of the liver. The basic blood work that's being done, just the SGOT and the SGPT, will miss tons and tons of cases with really severe NASH. You know, more and more fiber scans are being, being done. But the metabolic consequences throughout the body, high presence of diabetes, presence of hyperlipidemia, all the risk factors for heart, for, for heart disease. Then mental can't be understated, especially people on medications. Obesity is basically, or energy balance is centrally re regulated. So it's really difficult because many of the medications that we take, you know, actually kind of sedate the brain, causing less anxiety, less kind of moving ar 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 around. So the mental status, again, really needs to be stable to have the best impact. And finally, a thing that we don't like to talk about, but really, really, really important is money because we have an inverse relationship where the worse the food is, the cheaper it's more available. What we subsidize is very, very weird. And, you know, trying to eat healthy is rather, rather expensive. And requires a lot of planning. And, you know, unfortunately, the people who are most afflictive probably have the most stressful lives, which allows them least to plan. And, you know, more and more of those people are coming to surgery and the results are okay, but we don't change the, 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 many of these metrics. And that's something as a society that we really, really have to tackle. So the short-term benefit is basically we see a resolution we're the only treatment currently for NASH, the only treat, you know, the best treatment for diabetes. With certain operations, we can have a resolution of type 2 diabetes from 70 to 90%. When you lose weight, you move around better. The x-ray is not getting better, but we may push off the need or prevent for years the need for a joint replacement. All of these things are great. But where we need to do a better job explaining and tracking you know, is the fact that when you lose weight, and we look, talked about medical, Wegovy, the GLP analog that came out that showed 16% average weight loss, those patients lost approximately 13% of their lean muscle mass. So we need to do a better job of really getting more people. You know, we do a pretty good job of emphasizing the importance of protein. Um, our dietitians are wonderful. You know, my original dietitian wrote something called the 10 commandments to give all these patients very, very simple rules. You know, they teach them to eat the protein first, the vegetable second, the starch after that. They've done a phenomenal job across the country. They, they're really kind of the, the soul and the heart of every bariatric program across the country. Um, but again, their influence wanes as people become less frightened. You know, they, they, they reach their new norm, their new plateau. And then they kind of, it's like no different than the person that, you know, you know, well, they're happy. Mm -hmm. They lost some weight, but are they, ha are they healthy on the inside? What's happening? You know, in, in the aging process, you're going to be losing muscle. You're going to be losing, you're going to be losing, um, um, bone mass. And what I would say is this is 
probably the greatest problem for us to have that we've got, we're going to get so many of these people to live 20, 30 years that we need to start preventing these problems now. So I think it's a, it's, it's, you know, in a strange way, a good problem to have, to have to be worried about the long-term future of these operations, because, you know, when we were doing them in the first generation, back when I started in 1995, we're talking about a small amount of people. We're talking about 20, 30,000 people in the next year. 250 to 300,000 people have bariatric surgery in the United States. And many people believe it's the most underutilized treatment in the world. And that's because of so much of the stigma and bias that remains against obesity. So, so Mitch, uh, uh, f- first of all, bariatric surgery for me, it's like a magic pill. It's amazing what it's doing for, for the person. It's uh, unbelievable how a person changes. Uh, not overnight, but a few months later, is a, is a different person. The the perception of the person, yeah, the perception of the person. They feel good with himself. If you, I've seen a few of them, and it's it's really amazing. And the, uh, not talking about all the uh, medical effect and the the health effect. My my question is today, as you said, there are a, a, a few new drugs that are coming to market. So if you will have a, a magic wand and you can go ten years ahead. Do you think that uh, the majority of uh, 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 the intervention will still be bariatric surgery or will move more and more into drug treatment? Look, you know, uh, I, 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 I'm approaching my 60th birthday. My kids remind me every time when, you know, when I try to be a weekend warrior. Um, and um, I, I, I think that I'm going to be unfortunately quite busy you know, until, you know, the time comes. And I think that number one, when we're talking about such a large segment of the population, actually, you know, there's a reason why businesses of the same genre go to the same place. And, and that's because that's where the people are. So the more drug therapy that comes to market and, you know, again, sometimes we criticize some of these entities, but now that Lily and Nova Nautis are here, we're going to hear much more convincing arguments as to why obesity should be treated. Virtually everything else, we treat the phenotype. In obesity, we look at, well, does this person have a problem because of their weight? So now, okay, so the person who's trying to be healthy, we should send them to McDonald's for a week and then repeat their blood work and then say, okay, now they're not healthy and they come to surgery. So we're going to have to have an abrupt change in, you know, again, and this is again, what the people in in longevity are talking about, treat the other things. So we're spending less on insulin. So we're spending Mm -hmm. less on certain medications that are controlling chronic diseases. And once, once you're on insulin, you know, the game is almost over, you know, same, like steroids. You know, when we were in medical school, they used to say steroids make you walk all the way to the grave. So once you're on insulin, you know, the, the, the clock has sped up, you know, you know, type one diabetics who exercise a lot, you know, different story, but type two diabetes, once you're on insulin, which is actually an anabolic hormone, you know, the clock is now re- really, really sped up. So I think we're going to have a real, real difference. Also, you have to look at the fact that Every study that's ever been done in obesity is always better than the real life experience. You have great dietitians, you have a real Hawthorne effect, so the data is also going to be better. And perhaps the biggest point is that the majority of people who are getting, getting medications have BMIs between 27 to 35 in clinical trials. So if you look at my results from surgery and you look at my patients who, you know, I say a double an average weight or the ones who just kind of meet criteria, you're going to see very, very, very different results. So, okay. So, 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 so what I understood from you that actually it's a different population, your it's population a, it's is different population and yeah. it's too early to extrapolate. Yeah. But my hunch is that the closer you are, the less afflicted you are, the better you're going to do. So what I think is going to happen is the toolbox is going to be more complete. More people are going to be treated. And the other thing is there's going to be a significant amount of the large people that are going to be treated with surgery 
and then require medications for ongoing plateau management. Mm -hmm. It's going to be a completely new world. And my guess is just like originally with mental health, it's like, we're not paying for anything. Okay. Surgery is already broken through. What's going to happen is all these treatments are going to break through and that's going to create people moving into each sector. The other thing that's happening in, and you're going to see this in longevity is like, when you started talking about this, no one knew what you were talking about. But again, I'm reaching the last third of my career. When I started talking to doctors, they said, what are you going to do? Okay. Now, everybody that's trained in medicine, that's less than 60, bariatric surgery has been something that they refer to. So we've actually reached a line where it used to all be self-referrals. Now I would say 60% of our patients come from other doctors, whether it's orthopedics before joint replacement, infertility, cardiology, ophthalmology with people with retinopathy, podiatrists because, you know, of diabetic foot ulcers, gastroenterologists because of fatty liver disease, you know, and a lot more pediatrics. I see at least two to three people below the age of 20 a week. Wow. I think your point of treating ob obesity being something that needs to be treated as opposed to our focus just on the symptoms is a key one, even for nutrition, Medicare, the largest payer in the United States. If your only diagnosis is obesity, you can't get nutrition counseling. But once that turns into diabetes or progresses past that to chronic kidney disease, then it's worth a conversation, um, but not until it gets to a certain point. Well, Medicare um, allow you to talk that, to someone about him. And it, it isn't that absolutely absurd because once you have end organ damage, you know, let's 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 look at me and my colleagues as being the Lion King, you know, but we all live in the same ecosystem. Once you have had kidney disease, okay. Once you have these things, you've probably turned into an irreversible stage where you have so much mitochondrial damage that the chance of you oxidizing fat is slim and none. So you're actually p picking the worst subgroup to do that to. Okay. And you know what the funniest thing is? They have the data because they've never been able to show, and you know this, Ashley, an advantage for the diabetes intervention group. So they went ahead and they created the pre-diabetes intervention group. Okay. Yep. And what does that tell you? Once you've completely expressed your phenotype and have damage because of it, it's going to require something similar to transplantation to treat. You know, so the analogy would be, we're only going to take, we're going to test a new drug that prevents liver failure on people who are already on a transplant list and then extrapolate that di data. And, and it's just because of bias, because there's no rational argument that you can really give to it. Yeah. And uh, a few of our past guests, also David Sinclair was talking about aging also being a disease condition, treating it like a disease, not treating it as something that just happens, which I think is interesting to put those two next to each other. <laughs> well, I loved, I loved reading David Sinclair's book. I love living his, 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 his pod class. I think that, you know, what we bring to the equation is the human experience and the variation that you see, which you lose sight of when you're a, a researcher. And I think that our patient subgroup really get, you know, is, is really great because, you know, when you listen to researchers, you know, again, they're dealing with homogenous studies. So they think everybody behaves the same. And then again, they control their variables, you know, and the mice that are used probably are so genetically related, you know, so that they control their variables so they can study one thing the whole time. Unfortunately, the real life experience is somebody that has pros here, cons here, and putting it together. So one of the great reasons why I'm here is because I really look forward to looking together, working together to kind of put those things to real life. Because what I would believe is that the patients that I see are David Sinclair's aging patients to the squared power. 
So we have exponentially sped up the process for him. And again, I became really aware of that when we did research, you know, with some of my, you know, co-investigators who were all from the medicine uh, department, Tara Kim, who's a great young endocrinologist, Jamie Kane, who runs our medical obesity part, um, and a few other people. We looked at the survival and the death rate of the people admitted to COVID. And what we saw is that, you know, the way BMI correlated is that there was a phase change so that, you, you know, essentially you were physiologically older if you had COVID. So a 75 year old that was not obese would behave like a 65 year old who was obese, which is exactly what David Sinclair is trying to say. Yeah. And going further, what's going further about that is, you know, the biggest argument on, on the longevity space are like the people live to a hundred because of the genes that they were born with, which I guess would be kind of the perspective of people who've done the genetic studies at Montefiore. And there's virtually nothing you can do or David Seclair, where you can take something that raises your two your two in and then extend survival. Probably the truth lies somewhere in between, but I think that we can give you the best model to kind of look at that variation and the impact of how, rapid change in diet and yeah. exercise can actually affect human beings and turn that curb and then estimate the benefits. Go ahead. Ed. Yeah. The, 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 the bariatric surgery is in a way expedi expedite model of uh, aging in humans. So it's a, it's a, a it's a nice reversal. way to and that, age reversal. Sorry. Yeah. yeah age aging reversal in human. And uh, also I think that it's a, it's a, it's a great uh, way to show how one intervention Maybe it's uh, one of the best one intervention that shows so much an effect because uh, we have seen in our research that BMI is one of the most important uh, or most correlated uh, uh, one number that uh, correlated with uh, uh, mortality or poor longevity. So uh, it's definitely a, a very fascinating to look at that in uh, this uh, angle of uh, longevity. Absolutely. And as a, a final sign off that we ask all of our guests, is there a top tip that you would recommend to improve lifespan or health span? Um, if it's not just one, it can be a small handful, but uh, something super actionable. I, again, I think that, you know, essentially there's only one, the best way, ways to be healthy is what everybody on your podcast has talked about, you know, it's a healthy diet with an adequate protein source that emphasizes a, a lot of fiber plant-based with that. Again, you know, I think people like Mark Hyman have called it a pegan, uh, you know, type diet. I think starts, you can't be healthy unless you're physically fit and you have reasonably muscle strength. So we should all attain to do those things. And again, you know, one of the things that I would argue is a coming away thing from COVID is what I've seen in my practice is so many people where people have lost sight of the psychological impact of people being separated and the impact on lifestyle of people, people sequestered that maybe mm -hmm. I'm very, very wrong, but I think that the long-term negatives that have been caused by obesity and psychologically and, and lifestyle by basically keeping people inside are going to exceed the infectious disease rates. You know, so I think that it was something that had to be done at certain times, but I don't think we've done a good enough job of thinking of the long-term implications of that. So it's really great to kind of keep everybody incarcerated. They won't die of COVID, but as you've seen from all of the blue zones and everything that you do, being healthy is kind of a consortium of things. And I think we exceeded that mark. And unfortunately, I've seen a lot of people who were relatively active who went because they had some chronic problems and were so scared to die of COVID that have become completely disabled by gaining 20 mm -hmm. to 30 pounds by being locked in their house. And I think that's really sad. And I don't think people are really talking about that. Yeah. I was just going to say, I enjoy when we have, you know, very scientific individuals on the podcast that always do still take it back to human connection. Um, I think that's a nice reminder for all of us that 
that's you know, something that's really difficult to study and quantify, but is incredibly important. Ashley, and that's what the dietitians have really brought to our program. Because, you know, again, you know, we started this, it was all a mechanical exercise. No, you know, nobody grew up wanting to be a bariatric surgeon. You know, we, 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 we will, you know, this was new. It was exciting. We were the first generation of minimally invasive surgeons that could do more than take out a gallbladder. We figured out how to reconstruct things. And, you know, there weren't, you know, et cetera. At the same time, you had an obesity epidemic. We found out it worked. But it's really the ancillary people that came in. And when we realized we needed multimodality programs that have really brought the humanistic you know, message to us, you know, and, and really helped improve the overall and make it a much safer and also a much more long lasting treatment. Awesome. Well, thank you so, so much for your time with being in here with us today for educating all of us. On... Yeah, I certainly haven't learned that much about bariatric surgery ever. So I appreciate the education. Well, I, you know, thank you for having me. You know, I've really enjoyed starting to work uh, with Inside Tracker, and I think that we really can can you know really do some valuable things in the future, and look forward to collaborating more. And you know, the friendships that I've developed with Gil and some of the other people. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mitch. That was a pleasure to learn and uh, become uh, wiser from you. Well, well, thank you. You're being too kind. <laughs> And we look forward to exploring the research in the field of longevity each month with you and the leading scientists. For more information, please go to www.insighttracker.com slash podcast. Thanks for listening to Longevity by Design. Please subscribe to this podcast on Apple, Spotify, or YouTube. Longevity by Design is powered by Inside Tracker a personalized health optimization platform that helps people improve their lives by improving their bodies from the inside out using personalized, science-backed recommendations for nutrition, supplements, and lifestyle changes. To learn more, visit InsideTracker.com slash podcast.